And Mordecai told him of all that had happened unto him and of the sum of the money that Haman had promised to pay the king's treasuries for the Jews to destroy them. And Hatag made, came and told, um, uh, told Esther the words of Mordecai. And all the, all the king's servants and the peoples of the king's provinces do know that whosoever, whether man or woman, shall come unto the king into the inner court, who is not called, there is one law of, of his to put him to death, except to, uh, such to whom the king shall hold out the golden scepter, that he may live. But I have not been called to come in to, unto the king these thirty days. Then Mordecai commanded to answer Esther, Think not with thyself that thou shalt escape in the king's house more than all the Jews. Then Esther bade them return to Mordecai this answer. Altogether, please. So Mordecai went his way and did according to all that Esther had commanded him. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this morning, for another privilege, dear Lord, to go into your word, look into the story, dear Lord, of Esther and Mordecai. I pray, Lord, that you help us uh, as we study this. Help me as I uh, explain uh, some passages here. And I pray, Lord, that you uh, help us appropriate the principles that we will see in our lives. I pray that uh, for everyone who are seated here and are willing to listen, I pray that we will be humble, dear Lord, as well, and be willing, dear Lord, to be changed by your word, changed for the better, for your glory, dear Lord. May we be able to glorify your name in this time. Jesus, I pray. Amen. All right, so today we're uh, going to look at the book of Esther. And I was not, um, up until yesterday afternoon, I was not planning on uh, uh, preaching on this because uh, like I think last Thursday or Friday I was planning to preach on uh, Psalm chapter 10 so since um, uh, I'm not uh, in a, into any book study right now so the way I prepare the message is what the Lord has uh, been uh, teaching me and then I try to prepare a message to that through my uh, reading of the Bible as well but the Lord has uh, led me to preach on this I was typing this uh, La, uh, yesterday at the outreach and uh, Ponlu asked me and I was, I was blessed by his question because he said that oh is that the book of Esther I read that but I don't know why I don't see the the name of God or even prayer in this book that's what he said so I I was blessed because he noticed uh, you know all, all those things I, I don't know how many of us notice those kind of things when you read the Bible uh, and it's true this book of Esther does not mention the name God at all, and it's not mentioned prayer, it, but it does mention fasting, as we have read a while ago. But me, there, that's the reason why there are many issues with regard to this book. But here in the here in the book of Esther, it is a historical book. It's part of the historical books here in the Old Testament, where we can see the history or what happened to the chosen nation of God, up until uh, we, we even. Uh, Nehemiah as well was part of these historical books. Now that's what we're going to see here in Esther. Now the main, uh, what they call this uh, thing, that the reason why people want to remove the book of Esther from uh, this inspired scripture is that because again, it doesn't mention the name God. But even in the Hebrew text and Hebrew Bible, Esther has always been uh, accepted as one of the inspired uh, scripture. So uh, we have no... Um, 
we have no authority to question the word of God, right? We don't, we're not like, uh, you know, some people who question uh, words here in the word of God or even books of the word of God. We're only here to read the word of God and to really see what the Lord is telling us in all of these books. Now, the whole theme of, this, of the message today is to see that God is all over the book of Esther. Now, that's just what we're going to look at today. But as, along the way, as we look at the story, we're going to see as well um, many things or many principles that Mordecai applied in his life in order to be able for all these things to happen. Because when God does miracles and when God do wonderful things in the lives of his children, we see that he always uses a person. He always uses someone to partner with him. Now, he can do things uh, in a way, in a, uh, miraculously, in a way that he doesn't need any of us. But God chose to partner with us. God is looking for people who are willing and available to, to obey his will. Now, here in this book, we're going to focus more on Mordecai rather than Esther. Now, I believe I have preached this before, and um, uh, I think this was uh, years ago, uh, but I'm going to uh, preach on it uh, again, obviously, today. So while we go through the whole, whole story, we'll pick up some principles here. Now, here in chapter 1, we're not going to read every verse. We're, uh, we're just going to look at some key verses, but uh, since this is a Sunday school, we're going to have uh, story time. Okay, here in chapter 1, we see that King Asawerus made a feast to show the people his riches and glory. Now, this king, of course, he's a king, he's rich, he's um, glorious, he has all the kingdoms. So, while, while uh, here in chapter 1, he made a decision to make a feast uh, for the whole kingdom, and the feast lasted 180 days. For as, uh, as long as 180 days. So the whole kingdom, they're eating. I'm sure that if they're Baptists during this time, they would love this. 180 days buffet. Right? You eat all you can, drink all you can for 180 days. Now, after 180 days, uh, after they, they have finished the feast throughout all the kingdom, he decided to extend the feast seven more days. But only for the capital city, for where the palace is in Shushan. So remember that place is Shushan. So he extended it seven days. Maybe or probably because this is uh, where everything or all the work is uh, taking place. So he just wants to, you know, give more feasts to people who are closer to him in the palace. So here in uh, 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 he. Uh, gave seven more days. Now, we know in the Old Testament, if you've been watching uh, uh, histor histor oh, war movies or war series, you know that when there's a feast, there's a lot of sin, right? Uh, eat, uh, the gluttony is definitely a sin, and most of us are guilty. Uh, uh, drinking, they are drunk, you know, they don't make good decisions. Now, in the seventh day of the feast in Shushan, the king being drunk and be and you know if you're drunk the bible says that you're filled with the spirit of wine and you're not in your you're not sober you're not in the right decision you're not in your right thinking that's the reason why we as baptists do not believe in even tasting or just using wine as benefit to our bodies why because that is a door that we will open that we can be uh, addicted or or, or something uh, we can abuse the use of that now i know a lot of uh, uh, there are some pastors who do not prohibit drinking of wine but we do prohibit that and we and it's for the principle that it is uh, opening the doors of us to abuse this thing now while this king is drunk in the seventh day he decided to uh, command his people or his leaders to get to go fetch his wife named Vashti okay now his wife as, as uh, while the feast is going on they're having their own feast for the women of the palace for the uh, women of the of this king as a warrior. so uh, king said now fetch my wife for the purpose that I want to show all of you the beauty of my wife my wife is beautiful she's the most beautiful here in the country uh, here in the kingdom I want to show all of you now imagine the situation he's drunk men are drunk now he wants to call his wife to show drunk people his beautiful wife now this man of course uh, uh wanting to obey the king went to fetch uh vashti but vashti obviously refused now, i will not go in front of these people uh because i know it's not going to be a good thing so when vashti refused they brought back the word to the king and says that uh vashti refused to come okay now the king obviously got mad he's to, uh added uh, adding to the fact that he's drunk he was, his order was defied. Now, during this time, even if you're the wife of the king, if you defy the order of the king, you can be killed. 
Right? Remember in, in, in the story here, Esther, if she was not called by the king, even though she was the wife, she's not allowed to even go to talk to the king unless the king calls you. This is how they treat women before, especially the king. So now, uh, the leader named Memukan went to the king and said, your wife refused. Now, this is what uh, happened in, in, let's read in verse 16 to 22. The Bible says here, and Memukan answered, now the king was mad and he asked his leader, what shall we do? Okay, what shall we do to the queen? Then uh, Memukan answered before the king and the princess, Vashti the queen had not done wrong to the king only, but also to the princess and to the people that are in all the provinces of the king as a wearer. So he said that um, she had not only done wrong to you, but she had showed a bad example to all women in this kingdom. If the queen has the right to reject the, her husband's demand, then our wives will also someday reject our demands so we have to set an example for this deed the queen of the queen shall come abroad unto all women so that they shall despise their husbands in their eyes when it shall be reported the king as aware's commanded Vashti the queen to be brought in before him but she came not verse 18 likewise shall the ladies of Persia and Media say this day unto all the king's princes which have heard of the king of the queen thus shall there arise too much contempt and wrath verse 19 if it please the king, let there go a royal commandment from him, and let it be written among the laws of the Persians and the Medes, it is, and that uh, it not be altered, that Vashti come no more before King Asawaris, and let the king give her royal estate unto another that is better than she. So ba basically, the advice was this. Let the ki banish the king from the kingdom and find a new wife. That is the advice. Now, she didn't obey you. Set an example so that you will show our wives as well that they are not supposed to disobey us. They are supposed to obey whatever we say, no matter how wrong it is. So, uh, remove the queen from the palace, banish her, banish her from the kingdom, and then go find another wife. Now, it is correct. The Bible is uh, showing the principle, shows us the principle, especially in the New Testament, that wives should obey their husbands. But we see, we know, and we have studied uh, be even before, that wives only obey the husband in the context of Scripture. Now, wives, your job is to obey, to respect, and to submit under the authority of the husband. But husband's job is to love the Word of God and let the Word of God rule even, even in his authority. So, basically what the king did was, obey this uh, uh, advice by Memokan. So he banished the queen and then uh, um, uh, he is about to find a new queen. But in chapter 2, something happened. Here in verse number 1, chapter 2 verse number 1, the Bible says, After these things, when the wrath of King Asawaris was appeased, he remembered Vashti and what she had done and what was decreed against her. So now, he's not drunk anymore, he's not angry anymore, he's regretting what he did. Right? No, wala na pala akong asawa. I have no more wife. I remember my wife. I regret what I did. So now the, the leaders saw that the king, of course, he was sad he has no more wife. Now they are nervous. They have to find him a new wife. So what did they do? Here in verse, uh, uh, here, here in chapter 2, what they did was they set leaders on all the provinces. And all these leaders, their job was to find a beautiful lady, beautiful woman. In all the provinces, they have to bring a beautiful lady, take the beautiful woman, bring, it to the, bring them to the palace, beautify them even more so that the king can choose a new wife. So in verse 5, this is where um, Mordecai comes in, the picture. Now in Shushan, the palace, there was a Jew, a certain Jew, whose name was Mordecai, the son of Jair, the son of Shimei, the son of Kish, a Benjamite. Verse number 6, who had been carried away from Jerusalem with the captivity which had been carried away with Jeconiah, king of Judah, whom Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, had carried away. Now, he was part of the people who were carried away from Jerusalem. So, we know that Mordecai has the principles of God in his heart. He has the principles of God. He was from the country of God. Now, when, he went to, when, when they were carried away here to this place, Mordecai brought along with him Esther. Now, here, Esther is someone who is, uh, what do you call this, uh, uh, an orphan. Her uh, parents died because of, of the war. And now, Mordecai is taking care of her. Now, what Mordecai did, uh, uh, eventually, to, to, to um, uh, fasten, uh, fast forward a little bit, Esther was uh, seen by the leader as a beautiful woman. Now, Mordecai obviously took good care of her. Now they saw that she was a beautiful woman. So they took her, brought her to the palace to beautify her even more. So what Mordecai did while Esther was in the palace, or be even before Esther came to the palace, gave her an advice. Do not tell them your nationality. 
Don't tell them that you're a Jew. They don't know that, you don't have to tell them. Why? Because I know if you tell them, even though this is a new king, it's not Nebuchadnezzar anymore, he still has this feeling against Jews, right? So don't tell them you're a Jew because they will not choose you. So she went there and she obeyed that. So what Mordecai did was every day he walks into the palace just checking what is going on with Esther. Now after one year of beautification, one year of, I don't know how they beautify themselves during this time, but... Esther was already beautiful, but they spent one year with her to make her even more beautiful before even showing her face to the king. Now, after one year of beautification, it was Esther's turn to face the king. Now, remember, up until this time, the king has not chosen any wife. One year. Now, when um, with these women, when they're about to face the king, they're supposed to choose gifts to bring as well so that they, 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 they will be chosen by the king. But Esther chose not to bring any gift. Now, when Esther went to the king... She, she went there without any gift, just herself, just her beautiful self. Now, the Bible says when she entered the palace, everyone was astonished at her beauty. I don't know how beautiful she was, but everyone was astonished at her beauty. That There were no words that have to be spoken. Right there and then, they made her queen. She is that beautiful. They made her queen, and the, and the, and the king really loved her because of her beauty. Now, in chapter, uh, now that's what happened here in uh, um, chapter 2. After that, the end of chapter 2, we see something that happened. Now, here's when we start to see, obviously see, the hand of God. Now, from the beginning, of course, the hand of God was there. But at the end of chapter 2, Mordecai was at the gate of the palace, and there were two men whose name was Big Than and Ther Teresh. Big Than and Teresh, who were talking. They're talking to each other and said they, they're planning to kill the king. So what Mordecai did, obviously, was went to Esther and said, hey, uh, there are two men, Big Than and Teresh, talking and plotting to kill the king. So Esther told the king, and the king believed Esther, and those two people were hacked. Now, we'll, this thing will be very important later on in the story. So now, here in chapter 3, we fast forward to chapter 3, we see here a man, a new character that was uh, introduced. His name was Haman. Now, Haman is a very wicked person, but the king, we don't know the reason, but the king promoted him to be second in command in all the, in all the kingdom. His name is Haman. So after the king, it's him. Now, Haman was very, he loved power. He loved authority. So he commanded people that every time to treat him like the king. So every time he walks by, people has to bow to him. Every time that he walks by, people has to pay respect to him. But every time that he walks by, everyone does it even the Jews, except one person named Mordecai. Whenever he passes Mordecai, everyone's bowing, not Mordecai. Whenever he walks around the palace, everyone will respect him, not Mordecai. Simply because Mordecai knows that he's not supposed to bow down to this wicked person. He knows that he's about, he can be killed by disobeying the law, but he did this many times. Even his friends were advising him, why don't you just bow? You're going to get in trouble. He, 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 can kill, he, command, he can command you to be killed. But Mordecai never, uh, never bowed to, to Haman. So now, what happened was Haman asked around and says, Who is this Mordecai, Mordecai guy? Why is he not bowing to me? Who does he think he is? So now people told him he's a Jew. He's from Jerusalem. He's one of those people who were taken here. Oh, so I will punish him. But not only him, but all the Jews in the kingdom. I will kill him and all the Jews in the kingdom. So what Haman did was he made a decree. He went to the king and suggested something. You know, king, everyone's bowing to me here, but there's one man named Mordecai who's not bowing to me. Now I want to do something about it. Now the king said, what do you want to do? You're second in command. You can do anything you want. I want that someday there, there's going to be a day in the 12th year, uh, uh, just in the 12th month, there's a day in the 12th month that it's going to be an open Jew hunting season. There's going to be one day in the, in the whole kingdom that everyone is allowed to kill any Jew, men and women, even children. And people who will be able to kill Jews will be given awards. And you kill a Jew, bring it to his attention, he'll give you 10,000 silver. So that is the decree. So the king said, okay, I'll write it down, I'll seal it and, and give it to, to the whole kingdom. So that is what happened. Now, Imagine what was going to happen. Jew hunting season. People can kill Jews and get paid for it. Now, potentially this can anni annihilate all the Jews. Right? So Haman knew about it. And in chapter 4, he mourned. Just like Nehemiah when he, he learned about the, the, uh, uh, the state of Jerusalem. He mourned. He cried. 
He told people, uh, he, 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 sh he was shouting. He was wearing sackcloth and he rented his clothes. And in front of the palace, he was shouting. He's crying. Why? He wanted people to notice it. Now, what happened was Esther, it was brought to Esther's attention that your uncle is mourning. Now, Esther feared immediately. You're not allowed to mourn in front of the king's palace and she's, he's going to die. So Esther sent, ito yung binasa natin kanina. Esther sent, um, the servant asked Mordecai what's happening. Now to me, first thing here is very puzzling. Esther doesn't know what's happening. She's the queen and everything, uh, and the letter was uh, all around the palace or uh, all the kingdom already, but she doesn't know what's happening. So now uh, Mordecai told the, uh, uh, the, the servant, tell the queen this is what's happening. Give her the copy of the letter. So when Esther read about it, right, and, and, and in every preaching that we hear, Esther is like the bida. Right, because of the verse number 16. But look at the initial reaction of Esther. When she read the, uh, uh, the writing, she didn't fear for the life of the Jews. The first thing she feared was for her life and Mordecai's life. Right, because Mordecai was asking her to go to the king and ask him to remove this thing. But Esther said, no, if I do that, I'm going to die. And if you don't stop crying there, you're going to die. Why? Because I cannot... And, and in six months already, the king has not called me. I'm not allowed to go there, especially now that I'm sad. The king will kill me even if I'm the wife. So, so the, the, uh, the messenger went to Mordecai and told these things. But Mordecai, and, and this uh, first point that I want to make, Mordecai gave her a very simple advice. And uh, we're not going to read it, but I'm just going to paraphrase the advice here. His advice simply was to God... Now, even though we don't read it properly, uh, uh, literally here in the book, God will always protect His people. That's His advice. Now, you may not want to do something about it, but even if you don't do something about it, someone else will do something about it. And God will save His people. But since you're in that position, who knows? Maybe God put you in that position for such a time as this. Right? Now, God's plan will always prevail. God's plan will always happen. He will save His people. That's His promise. But... He placed you in a position to be used by Him, a privilege to be part of that plan. And if you don't do it, you will die, but other people will do it. So that, that's what, that's, that is the, uh, uh, what they call this, the uh, uh, message of Mordecai. So went to Esther, and Esther realized the correctness of what uh, Mordecai, uh, Mordecai said. And, and that's when she said, all right, fast for three days. We will also fast. I, I will go to the king, and if I die, I will die. So that is, uh, that is the, a verse that we, uh, that we always read and we, we take focus on. But up until this time, Esther was not doing anything wonderful at all. It was all Mordecai. He's raising Esther. He's giving advice to Esther. And now Esther realized this. Now Esther is uh, willing to be killed and willing to even uh, die uh, for, for, uh, for, for, for the Lord. Now here in chapter 5, uh, we'll just finish the story before we go to the message. And uh, we still have a lot of time. Here in, here in chapter 5, we see that Esther did something that we husbands are all too familiar with. Now, she has a plan. But you know, us husbands, we know this. What Esther did was she went to the center of the palace looking worried. Huh? You know, wives, they don't want, if they want something, they don't say it directly. Right? They make sure that you notice that they're not okay. And you ask them, once or twice or thrice, and then they tell you, right? But this is what she did. She was walking in the middle of the palace, obviously looking worried, obviously looking that she wants to say something so that the king will notice her. She doesn't want to go directly to the king. So, obviously, the king noticed her. So, like, like good husbands, when we notice that, we ask them, what's wrong? So, so, a husband called Esther, come here, what's wrong? What do you want to say? So Esther, being the, nor, the, being the typical wife that she was, didn't tell. Right? If you remember, you, your, your wife, the first time you ask them what's wrong, they will always say, nothing. Nothing's wrong. So that's what, what, what Esther did. She didn't say nothing, but what she did, she didn't say what was wrong. She said, okay, uh, I want to tell you something, but not now. I want you and Haman to go to a feast or, or to a banquet that I will sponsor uh, tomorrow. And then I will tell you. Okay, so the king said, all right, since you're my wife, I'll, I'll do it. So the next day, um, uh, him and uh, Haman went to the banquet. So they were drinking and eating. And he said, okay, we've done, we're, we've, ate, we've eaten. Now what's wrong? 
Even the king even told Esther, even if you ask for half of the kingdom, I will give it to you. Just tell me what you want. But again, Esther said, no, 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 I will not tell you. Come back tomorrow with Haman and then I will tell you. So the king is obviously bothered. Now, after the banquet, Haman and the king went away. Now, the Haman being very uh, uh, proud because the queen invited him to the dinner. Now, Haman went out and he was very happy. But then his day uh, took a, a turn for the worse when he saw a man named Mordecai outside. He said he was walking, he's happy, he just had a banquet with the king and the queen. I'm an important person. But then when he passed by Mordecai, Mordecai again didn't bow to him. Now his, ing his anger was kindled again. I really don't like this guy. I want to do something about it. So he went home. He called his, peop his wise friends and asked them. Now, uh, and he told them, you know, I'm rich. I have glory. People respect me. But every time I'm happy, I always see this guy. And he makes me sad. He never bows down to me. I don't know if you have that person in your life. Right? You're happy. You're okay. But there's this one person who makes everything worse. Right? For him, it's Mordecai. So his, uh, his uh, 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 wise friend said, okay, here's what you're going to do. You make gallows very high, and you're going to hang Mordecai there. You're going to kill him. But first, ask permission from the king. You don't just kill him. You go to the king, ask permission to kill him. Anyway, for sure, if the king is uh, 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 giving you favor, he will allow you to kill Mordecai. He said, okay, that's what I'm going to do. At the same time, the king was not able to sleep. Why? As, like good husbands, if you know your wives are not okay, you cannot sleep, right? Uh, you, until they tell you what's wrong, right? Or, or maybe you can still sleep. But you're still thinking about that. But the king obviously cannot sleep. He cannot wait for the next day. So he cannot sleep. What he did was he called his uh, servants and said, bring me the books of the Chronicles. I just want to read what's happening in my, uh, in my uh, kingdom. So while he was reading, he went back, he, he read the one in chapter 2, that there's a guy named Mordecai who was able to warn us of people trying to kill me, and then we hanged them, Big Ten and Teresh. So he called his servants. What did we do for this guy? Was he rewarded? Was he given glory? The servant said, no, nothing was done to him. There was no reward. He said, this cannot be. We need to reward this guy. What should we do? And exactly at that time, he saw outside Haman about Haman is coming. Now we know Haman's purpose was to ask permission to kill Mordecai. So, oh, Haman, good timing. You know, there's this guy who warned and I want to give him glory. Because I, I want him, to, uh, I want him to, uh, to show him that he's important, that people should respect him. Now Haman being the um, boastful person, he thought that he, the king was talking about him. So king said, what should we do? What do you think, Haman? Oh, I think you should get a horse and uh, put your royal robe upon him. Because in his mind, it's me. That's me. He's talking about me. Put your royal robe upon him. Call a guy to lead the horse around the kingdom and say, this is, my, uh, this is a someone you should respect. Everyone bow to him. Yeah, thinking it was him. Oh, good idea, king said. All right, call Mordecai and you do it to him. <laughs> like, I'm here to ask permission to kill Mordecai. But what happened was, you're asking me to put the royal robe to Mordecai, put him on a horse, uh, parade him around the city, and call everyone to respect him. You see the irony there? And if you don't believe in the hand of God, you think it's luck. Achamba. Achambahan nila. No, it's not luck. It is God moving behind the scenes and, the circ uh, and, and taking control of circumstances and making sure that these wicked people will know you cannot thwart my plan. I'm sovereign. I'm God. Right? So instead of that, that's what happened. Nilibut niya. Oh, bow before Mordecai. Bow before him. He's being respected. Right? So that's what happened. After that, he went, Haman went back home. The Bible says he had his head bowed and covered his head. He was so sad. I, don't, I can't even imagine what he's feeling. So he went there. He told his friends what happened. This is what happened. Now, this amazing thing uh, changed. Uh, here in uh, uh, verse number... 13, chapter 6, verse 13. Now, he told his friends what happened. Now, the advice of his friends changed completely. 6, verse 13. And Haman told Sarah, his wife, and all his friends everything that befallen him. Then said his wise men, they changed their uh, um, advice. And Sarah, his wife, unto him, If Mordecai be of the seed of the Jews, before whom thou hast begun to fall, thou shalt not prevail against him, but, thou, but shalt surely fall before him. Obviously, these people know about the God of the Jews. 
But now they're realizing what the stories we've heard, the miracles we've heard were done. That was done by the God of these Jews. It's happening right now. So what they said, if he's a Jew and this is what happened, you're not going to defeat him. Because we know God is working in, on his side. So before anything could happen, before he can say anything, the uh, servants of the king came. Hey, the king is calling you. You have to go to the banquet now. So he's sad. He has to pretend he's happy. Go to the banquet. But we know who, what he's feeling. So now in the banquet, when they arrive, king asked Esther, what do you want? Even if you ask for half the kingdom, I'm going to give it to you. So Esther said, okay, I'm going to tell you. What I want is for you to spare my life. Don't kill me. King said, what? What, what are you talking about? Kill you? What, don't you know that you gave a decree that during this day, everyone can kill the Jews? Don't you know that I'm a Jew? Remember, no one knows that she's a Jew. Now she's revealing the fact, I'm a Jew. Spare my life. Don't kill me. And, 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 and King said, who? said who, who gave this decree? And then Queen Esther pointed to him, Haman. He's the one who manipulated you into agreeing to kill the Jews. So the king in his anger stood up and went to the palace. Now Haman, you can imagine what he's feeling, very nervous. He knows he's going to get killed because it's him against the queen. And no matter how important he is, he knew that the queen is very important to the king. He's willing to give Esther half of the kingdom. So what happened is he begged Esther. He went to the room of Esther begging, please spare my life. Please don't kill me. At the same time, with the irony of the, the timing of the Lord, the king went back. Maybe he got angry. He just nagdabug lang. Bumalek. But he found Haman in the room of the queen. You're about to kill the Jews and you even want to get my wife as well? That's what happened to the king. Get this guy, hang him in the gallows. Now, the irony is he made the gallows to hang Mordecai. But he was the one who was hanged in that gallows. Now, this is the, uh, the first point here that I want to make. This book, even though it's not talking about God, but God is all over this book. Now, just because God is silent doesn't mean He's absent. And many times in our lives, we, real, we, we realize that God is silent. In Psalms chapter 10, verse 1, David uh, realizes, Lord, why are you hiding your face? Lord, why are you hiding before us? I cannot feel you. The wicked are prosperous. The wicked are flourishing. The wicked are killing the poor. This is all happening. But Lord, why are you not doing anything about it? Now, there are two kinds of people who can feel that the Lord is not present at all, that the Lord is not there. First are the utterly wicked people. These wicked people do not live their lives believing that there's no God. That's why they live their lives, if you read the whole book of chap chapter 10, they live their life thinking that even whatever wicked things they do, nothing will happen to them. But also another person who can feel that the Lord's presence is not there are people who are looking for the Lord's presence. If you're a person who's spiritual, if you're a person always seeking before the Lord's presence or asking the Lord uh, for blessing, if you don't feel that presence, you're going to know. The Lord, I can't feel you. You're not doing anything. Uh, something is happening. The Jews are about to get killed. You're not doing anything. But you know, even if the Lord is, uh, is uh, 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 silent, doesn't mean that He's not doing anything. He's always doing something. Now here in this story, you can see that the Lord's timing is great. Right? He, can, he could have just uh, 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 stepped in at any time and stopped all of these things. But he made all of these things to happen to make sure that it will not be mistaken that this is my hand, this is my work, and it's not yours. Hindi chamba lahat na nangyari. You see, all of, the, all of the things that happen are the perfect timing of the Lord. That's why in your life, if you see that what is happening is para bang wala na, I'm, I, I'm out of hope, I'm sad, I don't think anything is going to happen in my life, just wait on the timing of the Lord. If you keep on seeking Him, keep on asking for His will, he, there's going to be a time that you will realize what He's doing behind the scenes. That's why as believers, we should never ever think that the Lord is absent. That the Lord is not doing anything. He's a God. He's our Father. He's, God. He's our Heavenly Father. And He will not suffer us to just keep on uh, being sad in this life. Now, this is the person. Now, I don't know why people say that even if we don't read the word, of the word, the name of God here, you can see that all of these things happen simply because of God. Now, what are the things that we can learn out of Mordecai? First thing here is Mordecai saw the value of a young person. Now, there was war, and they were brought into captivity, and there's this girl named Esther who was orphaned. He could have just not cared about her. 
But he took her in and took care of her. Why? Because he knows the value of a young person. He knows that even young people, God will use someday. Now, the young people that you see here today, a few decades, some of us will not be here anymore. Right? Obviously. Uh, because we, we're not going to live forever. But after a few decades, the, the children that you see sitting in front, even these young people here, will be the people who are continue the work of God. That's why we should not think that it's a waste of time to invest in their lives. Let's not think that it's a waste of time to take care of them. Let's not think that it's a waste of time to bring them up in the fear and, and, and in the love of the Lord. That's why as parents, when God gives us uh, the blessing of children, the, the, our goal and our ultimate thing in our minds that should consume our mind every day was to how can I bring this child to the Lord? How can they grow up to be fearing the Lord, to be saved, and to be people who will, uh, who will fight wickedness and who will stand for the Lord someday? Why? Because I will not be here forever. And if I will not train these young people, no one will fight for the Lord someday. That's why, this is the reason why a lot of good churches many years ago are not existing anymore today. Why? Because they failed to train their young people. They fail to train their children. They think that since the kids grew up in a Christian home, in a Christian family, they're going to serve the Lord someday. They are completely wrong. Why? Because these kids, they sit there, they listen to the preaching, but someday when they can decide for themselves, and if they were not taught the doctrine of God, they were not taught the gospel of Christ, they will go far, far away from the church. That's why you will, let's not take it for granted. You know, you, you, we always say that to the kids that just because you're born in a Christian family doesn't mean you're saved. Now, we do the same mistake. Just because they're born in the Christian family doesn't mean they're going to serve the Lord. How many pastor's kids do we know that are not serving the Lord today? How many, uh, how many Christian kids do we know that are far away from the ministry today? Why? Because their parents have failed to train them in the Lord. What did the Bible says in Proverbs 22, 6? Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. The promise at the end has a premise that you train them. It's not automatic that they will not depart from God. It is only when you train them that they will not depart from God. That is your job. That is our job as parents. That should be our ultimate goal. You have kids, don't take them for granted. It's sad today. Even if uh, that, that pastors who are so uh, busy with the ministry, so busy with mission work, that they neglect their own kids. Yeah. They think, ah, oh, he's going to get saved eventually. He's in a church every Sunday. It's not a given. He's going to get saved if you work and work in his life. And make sure that he will... He will, uh, he will uh, uh, recognize the authority of the Lord someday. That's why it's important to discipline kids. Why? To let them know that their authority in their lives that they have to obey and make them ready that someday they will have to submit to the ultimate authority of God. Amen. The Bible says in Proverbs 13, 24, He that spareth his rod hateth his son, but he that loveth him chasteneth him betimes. The word betimes here means early. Or, in other words, immediately. Right? The Bible says if you really love your kid, you will immediately punish them whenever they do something wrong. It's not about, do it one more time. Huh? It's not like that. It's not about, wait till your dad goes home, comes home. It's not about that. The Bible says immediately. They do something wrong that is defiant against authority. You meet it immediately with instructive correction. That's what the Bible says. If you really love your kids, you do something immediately, you instruct them, tell them it's wrong, they have to know it's wrong. Why? Because if a kid will, not, will, will, will uh, uh, not respect the authority of the parents, which is the God-given authority in their lives, how do we expect them to submit to the authority of God someday, to repent and place their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ? They're not going to do that. right? Remember, if you have a monster at home, Frankenstein was not born, he was made. Right? Don't blame. If while your kids are tender, while your kids are there, uh, they're still listening to you, discipline them. Tell them what's right. Tell them that there's authority that you have to obey and you are not above your parents. Discipline them. Proverbs 19.18 says, Chasten thy son while there is hope. Let not thy soul spare for his crying. The Bible is clear, but most of the time, especially parents, we let emotions cloud the things that we have to do for our kids. Right? Uh, when they're crying, of course, you don't want them to keep crying. But that's what the Bible is saying. Because there's, there's going to be a time that when you spank them, they're going to be rebellious. Like, nay, for now, now I'm 28. If my dad will spank me, I might spank him back. Right? I'm not in the age of spanking anymore. If he spanks me in front of here, it's going to be trouble. I don't want to hurt my pride and my ego. Right? But 
there's a time to do that when they're young, when they're tender, when they let you do it. But when they grow up, it's, not, it's, not, it's too late. It's going to be too late. They're going to make their own choices and you have failed as a parent. And the book, this book I'm reading is very, very uh, 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 good, uh, insightful. It's just that children are like arrows, right? That you, you, God has given to you. They're your weapon to someday battle evil in this world. But if you don't uh, handle them properly, they're going to be battling on the, for the other side instead, right? So that's what we have to do. But Mordecai saw this in Esther. Now look at the result. God used Esther to save the people of Israel. Mordecai never knew that at first, but he knows that the value of a young person's life. That's why parents don't be magsawa sa 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 pagtutrain sa mga Sunday school teachers, your job is very important. Very important to train these kids. Very important to, to, to plant the seed of God in their hearts. Right? And make sure that you, you, all of the things that we do for them is on the end goal of them being saved. And the people who are in our outreaches, you know, who, who, th- who would have thought the first time I met these uh, people, they were still uh, y- so much younger three years ago, that they will be here today. Uh, who would have thought that Panlu will be, uh, will be used by God someday? If looking at him now, you still don't think he's going to be used by God. Just... Just joking, right? But I never thought that. No, he, he came to us. He, he was not wearing nice clothes. He was just studying English. But, you know, the Lord has given us this love for outreach to just keep on going, keep on teaching. We don't know the Lord is working in their hearts. And now they're here. They, are, they, they may be used by God mightily someday. So never underestimate the, that. Especially when you're old, like our pastor or, or some old people here. When you're old, di ba sabi nila, pag matanda ka na, ang trabaho mo na, ipasa mo na yan. I-train mo na. Para someday may magtutuloy. Don't be too selfish, right? Ah, maaga pa. Number two, Mordecai saw the simplicity of a life lived for God. Now, remember what Mordecai did? He was not bowing to Haman. He saw that it's important to live a life for the Lord. You're only going to live for 60 or 70 years. If you will live a life of compromise for those years, you're going to regret that in, when we face the Lord in the judgment seat of Christ. God is going to let you know you've wasted that. Now, God is giving us an opportunity now to stand for Him, to live, to do things that are of eternal value, and to not compromise our lives. Now, Mordecai could have compromised in many ways, right? He could have just nodded. Huh? Uh, uh, your, your, your Majesty. Uh, he could have just, uh, para bang, just, just recognize. Para bang wala nang problema. Diba? What about a half bow? You don't have to bow all the way. Okay, just like this. So that he will not get angry. He will not make my life miserable. But he said, I will not compromise. Stood. He stood. No matter who you are, I will stand. I'm not supposed to bow to you. Right? Now this talks about our conviction. What is your conviction? Are you convicted? Are you, uh, uh, what do you call this? Are you uh, convinced of the truth of the Word of God? If you are, are you willing to stand and not let the, the, the principles of the Word of God bow to the pressure of this world? Amen. Are you willing to do that? Are you willing to say that, oh, hey, you're going to lose this, you're going to lose this uh, friend? I'm not going to bow. Are you going to lose your family? I'm not going to bow. You're going to lose this fellowship? I'm not going to bow. Why? Because I know that someday I'll meet them some, uh, in heaven anyway. But now what, what's important to me is I will not compromise. I will not please them. I'll please the Lord. If that's what I see in the Bible, I will stand for it. Mordecai knows. I don't know, I don't know what, how much he knows. But at least he knows that he's not a, uh, supposed to bow to Haman. And he stood for it. What did the Bible says? Galatians 1.10 For do I now persuade men or God? Or do I seek to please men? For if I get pleased, man, I should not be the servant of Christ. If you're, if you're uh, uh, giving more importance to men, you're not uh, worthy to be called the servant of Christ. Romans 14, 8 says, For whether we live, we live unto the Lord. And whether we die, we die unto the Lord. Whether we live, therefore, or die, we are the Lord's. Now, we are supposed to live that way. Now, Mordecai saw that. If I just live my life for the Lord, no matter what happens now, someday I'm going to realize the joy and, and the reward of that. Now, we're not, sup- we're not called to be comfortable here on earth. Now, obeying the Lord is never comfortable. But it's what we are supposed to do. 
What else? Mordecai saw the inevitability of God's plan. Now, I, I, I preached a bit, a bit about this a while ago, but Mordecai saw the inevitability of God's plan. Mordecai saw that God will rescue Jews, uh, the Jews. Why? Because he saw that throughout history, many people tried to annihilate them. Now they're, in, now they're in captivity, but they're still there. They're still existing. And he knows that the Lord has promised. And he's, he, he, said, he told Esther, this is a great opportunity to be used of God to save his people. If you're not going to do that, someone else is going to do that. But don't miss out on the opportunity. Now, we have to realize that God doesn't owe us anything. Realize that God doesn't need any of us here. God doesn't need me. God doesn't need you. If God plans to save a lot of people here in Cambodia, it's going to happen. But it's a wonderful opportunity to be given to us to carry out that plan. If I will say no, God will raise someone else to do it. If you will say no, God will raise someone else to do it. Why? Because God's plan is never, ch is never changing. It will always happen. Proverbs 19.21, what, what did the Bible say? There are many devices in a man's heart. Nevertheless, the counsel of the Lord, that shall stand. Isaiah 14.24, the Lord of hosts had sworn, saying, Surely as I have taught, so shall it come to pass. And as I have purposed, so shall it stand. And one day, someday, we will realize the plan of God. And if we let the opportunity pass by, it's your loss. Hindi po tayo kailangan ng Panginoon. Right? Hey, you go into your outreach, even if you don't go on Saturday. Start, starting on Saturday, don't go. And don't go anymore into the outreaches. God is still going to do great work in the outreaches. You just missed out on the blessing. It's an opportunity. That's why it's puzzling to me that when God gives us opportunity to serve Him, we let it pass by. Why? Because... Hindi naman, para bang hindi ko kayo kailangan, pero sige, bibigyan ko kayo ng chance na sumakay para makita nyo yung blessing. Now, if God plans for this church to be here for a long, long time, even if you go, it's going to happen. But you're going to miss out on a lot of blessings. The, the, the counsel of Mordecai to Esther was very simple. Hey, God will never allow this to happen. But you have to allow yourself to be available to be used of God. Who knows? Maybe God placed you here for such a time as this. Think about that. You're here now. Maybe God placed you here for such a time as this. What kind of time are we living in today? Time of compromise, apostasy, and, and, and the time where the Bible is not important anymore. Maybe God called you and allowed you to know all of these things for such a time as this. Don't let the opportunity pass you by. Now, uh, our next point here, Mordecai used promotion as an opportunity to, to be a blessing to others. We know the story. After Haman was hanged, the ring of Haman was given to Mordecai. The house of Haman was given to Esther. But the authority of Haman was given to Mordecai. Now, Mordecai now is now second in command. Now, instead of enriching himself, blessing himself, what he did immediately was to reverse the, the decree of the king. He said that, I will make a decree that during this time when people are supposed to kill the Jews, we will allow the Jews to fight for their lives. Okay? Now, when people try to kill them, they can fight for their lives and kill the enemies instead. So the king agreed, sealed it, and then uh, it was uh, uh, given, given throughout the whole city. And, and in chapter 8, verse 17, here's what happened. And in every province and in every city, whithersoever the king's commandment and his decree came, the Jews had joy and gladness. Because they know, okay, we can fight back. Feast, uh, and a feast and a good day. And what happened to the enemies? And many of the people of the land became Jews. So what happened? Because of the authority of that, God used him to save other people as well. For the fear of the Jews fell upon them. If, God, if you allow God to use you and God to promote you and use that promotion for the blessing of others, then God will bless so much more people. Here in, uh, the, the, uh, here in chapter 10, verse 3, let's fast forward to there. Let's see how the tables completely turn. So now they say that you can fight back. What had happened in chapter 10, verse 3? For Mordecai the Jew was... Oh, uh, we'll go there later. So everything, hap uh, everything the, the tables completely turned. And during the day of the Jew hunting season, it was a fight. But what happened was more enemies were killed. And even in Shushan, the palace, 500 enemies were killed in the palace. Now, instead of the king getting angry, these Jews are killing my people, what he did was when he saw 500 men killed, he went to Esther and asked her, is that all you want or do you want more? That's what he said. Do you want more? You can kill more if you want. That is the favor that God gave Esther. Because people were willing and available to, to be used of God. What did Esther say? No, that's not enough. We want to kill more. And we want the ten sons of Haman to be hanged in the gallows as well. 
So, that's what happened. Tables completely turned. The Jews were supposed to be annihilated during this day, but instead, people were converting to the Jewish faith. And then people were being afraid, and people who do not want to convert were being killed. Why? Because Mordecai used that promotion to bless other people. What did the Bible, the Bible say in the last verse of Esther, chapter 10? For Mordecai the Jew was next unto King Asawerus, and great among the Jews, and accepted of the multitude of his brethren, seeking the wealth of his people and speaking peace to all his seed. That's how he used authority. Now when God placed you in authority, when it is sure that God is the one who placed you in authority and you're a righteous man, you're going to use it to uh, bless other people. What did the Bible say in Galatians 6.10? As we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. Are you in a position where you can bless people? Are you in a position where you can influence people? Do that for people, not for yourselves. Why? Because Psalm 75, 6-7 says, For promotion cometh neither from the east, nor from the west, nor from the south. But God is the judge. He putteth down one and setteth up another. It is God who places that. If God placed you there and He worked circumstances to place you in authority, He will use you mightily. Just like Joseph, just like David, right? uh, just like these people who God placed in authority. Why? It's Him who placed them in authority. Now, this verse is being used you know, by a certain person this day that God is the one who gives promotion and put it down. Don't claim this verse because you went on a campaign. These people didn't go on a campaign. Mordecai never made a campaign, right? God just placed him there. The reason why Joseph was leader in Egypt, because God placed him there. He never dreamed, uh, he never wanted to do that, right? If it's God who placed you, God is give, will give you the promotion, may, be sure that God will use you mightily in that promotion. Now, my, uh, the, the end challenge here, and it's already uh, 10, the, 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 the end challenge here is that God is always working something for us. And if you read the whole Bible, you see that God is a God whose timing is very... Parang uh, napakaganda. Remember what happened uh, to the three Hebrew children? If you just watch, make it a movie and watch it. It's very thrilling, right? They didn't bow. They were thrown into the fire furnace. They're supposed to be dead. But God allowed it to go as far as that just to show the people His wonder. His might and his and the miracle. Remember, uh, uh, even uh, what they call this. Even when Peter was in prison, he was about to be beheaded. The next day, what did God do? He he made people to sleep so that the angel can just go and walk him out of prison. Right? Just make just imagine all of these things. That is God's timing. That is how He works. He does something in a way to make sure that we will not mistake His work. Remember Gideon and the 300 men? That is something I would pay to watch live. Right? 300 men killing thousands of people. Remember when, when, uh, when uh, uh, the Israelites were, were running away from Egypt? Right? Mountains left and right, Red Sea in front, the Egyptians coming after them. That's an impossible situation. God leads you into impossible situations to show you His might. What did God do? They're about to get killed. He, he parted the Red Sea. Can you imagine that? Mamamatay na sila, pa, talo ng lahat ng pelikula sa panahon natin eh. Mamamatay na sila, biglang parted the Red Sea, go through. And di pa natapos sa Panginoon, pinatay niya lahat in that Red Sea. That is the timing of the Lord. That's why, even if you think that nothing's gonna happen, I'm in an impossible situation. I'm in a situation that I will never be used by God. Nothing's ever gonna happen in my life. Be sure that God is doing something. And God will do something that you will never mistake in na effort mo. It is all God. This, but we have to ha allow Him to do that. Allow Him to use us and just be available for Him. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, uh, thank you for uh, this morning and even for the...